In February 1985, Greg Sorbera promised his wife that by the summer, his dalliance with provincial politics would be over. Not quite. Sorbera unexpectedly won that provincial election and many more after that, eventually becoming Mr. Everything for Premier Dalton McGuinty, Liberal Party President, Finance Minister, Chairman of three election campaign wins and more. Sorbera eventually did get out of politics as he promised his wife more than a quarter century later. He chronicles it all in his autobiography, The Battlefield of Ontario Politics, and we're happy to welcome Greg Sorbera back to TVO. Hi there. Oh, nice to be here. <laughs> well, let's start right there. We're back in February of, of, of 1985. Let's start there. Why did it see, you're running in a riding that hadn't voted liberal in four decades. Yeah. Why did that seem like a smart place at the time to plant the flag? Well, a couple of things. Uh, the first is, that's where we were living. We were living right in the heart of this riding. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, in the back of this mind and this psyche was the notion that uh, maybe a life in a parliament uh, was part of my future. Uh, and then also I, I had a sneaking suspicion that notwithstanding the history of the riding that it was, would be possible to win it. You had lived in British Columbia, yeah. in the mountains, a kind of a flower child. Yeah. Uh, coming back to Ontario, running for parliament, you told your wife you wanted to run and what did she say to that? Uh, she said, just count me out. <laughs> <laughs> she was never a fan of politics, was no, she? No, she wasn't a fan of no. politics, but uh, uh, over the years uh, and my life in politics, I've been so incredibly grateful that she wasn't a fan in po of politics because uh, she brought to our family all the other parts of life that are important. You know, I was the extrovert, she was the introvert. She was the one that carried about the arts and spiritual matters and uh, the strengths of the family. So it turned out to be a good balance and we survived it all. You won that first election. You found yourself shortly thereafter, 39 years old, in cabinet, David yeah. Peterson's government. What did you know about being a cabinet minister at that moment? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so what were you doing there? <laughs> well, you know, uh, you know, go back to that time. David Peterson had 48 members. Right. Uh, we were actually we actually finished second in that 1985 election, uh, and uh, Peterson had to form a cabinet and people all of the committees, and he had to put a new face on the notion of government. He also had this idea that uh, the cabinet and the caucus had to reflect the real face of Ontario. So a 39-year-old Italian-Canadian from a riding just outside of Toronto, I guess made sense with, to him. Although you say in the book when he brought you in for your one-on-one -on -one to give you the job, you were skills development and colleges and universities minister, he said, we're not going to let that business about your background influence this. Yeah. What did he mean by that? You know what, it's uh, always been a mystery and uh, I've never raised it with him. Uh, it might have been uh, a couple of things. It uh, might have been, and I tell this story in the book, uh, the fact that uh, back in the 30s, my dad was arrested and went to jail for passing counterfeit money. This was the dirty 30s and things were really tough. Or it might have meant that uh, uh, when I was in British Columbia, I was uh, ragging on the RCMP to stop arresting people simply because uh, they chose to smoke marijuana. But I didn't pursue that, and David has never expanded the story. <laughs> that government lasted five years. In 1987, you won re-election, massive majority government, and then three years later, it was over. Bob yeah. Ray's New Democrats beat you guys. At that point, you decided, with a grand total of five years of public life behind you, to run for the leadership. Yeah, How come? Right. Well, you know, everyone that is in the parliament, well, let's, uh, 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 let's quote the late Keith Davey, the wonderful rainmaker for Trudeau's liberals. Uh, he says it most succinctly, uh, every caucus member thinks he has the ability to be in cabinet and every cabinet minister uh, thinks he has the ability to be the leader. Uh, David stepped down right after the election in 1990 uh, and I actually thought, uh, despite it all, that I might have a pretty good shot at being the leader. And uh, I wasn't entirely wrong. It didn't go well, uh, although I was happy with the result. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I just, I, I thought that the new leader had to come from the class of 1985. Uh, those who had been there before might have been there too long. And that massive majority that we won in 1987, perhaps the people from that era were not quite ready to leave the party. In fact, you actually were doing pretty well until a third candidate who wasn't supposed yeah. to be in the race. The interim leader, a guy named Murray Elston, promised not to run. Yeah. Then he went back on his commitment and decided to run. 
What did that do to your campaign? Uh, took all the wind out of it. <laughs> I knew uh, when Murray came in, uh, uh, I just knew it was over. Uh, up until that time, it really was emerging as a race between Lynn McLeod uh, and uh, my candidacy. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I thought I had a pretty good shot at it. Uh, we represented very different uh, uh, histories in the party. Uh, Lynn was a northern member, uh, came from, uh, you know, having been on a school board. I was an urban member, kind of represented the new ethnic reality, if I can use that term, uh, in the party. So I thought I had a pretty good shot of it. Then Murray, I think as a result of a lot of pressure from the elite of the party, changed his mind went back on his word, uh, and decided to uh, uh, throw his hat in the ring. Came nine votes short. Oh, my that goodness. That was pretty yeah. close, eh? <laughs> it was. At 1 o'clock in the morning at yeah. Cops Coliseum, I think. Yeah, yeah that's right. That was right. a close one. Yeah. Um, You've referred to it a couple of times. I don't remember hearing any, and I remember covering the convention, and I didn't hear much about it at the time, but you refer in the book to the fact that being an Italian-Canadian, you felt it in some parts of Ontario that, that the party wasn't ready for that. How did you sense that? Well, you know... Uh, it's interesting because until I became a politician, uh, I really didn't think of myself as an Italian-Canadian. I mean, my dad immigrated to Canada uh, in the mid-1920s, and by the time I was born, 40 years later, or 20 years later, uh, in 1946, the family was uh, part of uh, you know, a white Anglo-Saxon northern Toronto community. Uh, but... My dad was uh, made it a very important part of our education to understand our Italian heritage, and he insisted that we all learn how to speak Italian. So, 1985, I find myself in the midst of a campaign in a community, at that time it was called York North, a riding, uh, which had a huge Italian Canadian population. So, in the greater Toronto area, it was, in terms of the leadership campaign, a little bit of a plus. But uh, uh, when you went to places like the Bruce Peninsula or Eastern Ontario, there was a very different mood. You felt a kind of a chill. Uh, as I say in the book, uh, you know, I got the sense that liberals were saying, an Italian-Canadian from a wealthy development family? Remember, most people won't remember, but at that time there had been a big battle uh, on, uh, uh, on some issues relating to Patty Starr and the influence of developers on David Peterson. Uh, and people just, uh, it was, uh, the chill in the air was very discernible. <laughs> Uh, and I, I knew that I wasn't going to get a lot of delegate support from uh, the so-called hinterland in the province. I want to ask you uh, a bit about you decided to leave politics in 1995 of your own volition, but then you came back, first as party president, then as an MPP in a by-election, and the leader at the time is this sort of uncomfortable, awkward-looking guy named Dalton McGuinty, who lost the 1999 election to Mike Harris, and I wonder if after that loss, did you really think this guy ever could be premier? Well, I did. Uh, in fact, You really did? Yeah, no, I, 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 I honestly did, and for two reasons, Steve. Uh, the first is that the convention that chose him in 1986, I was there. 1996. Uh, uh, 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there. I hadn't had a candidate. I was out of politics. I listened to the speeches and I thought, this guy McGinty has the capacity to grow into someone who could lead the party and lead the government. So I supported him that night. And then I went back to my business. Uh, I was involved with... Uh, businesses in the Czech Republic and a group of us own this wonderful little baseball team in St. Catharines, Ontario. Uh, and then I got a call from him asking me to consider becoming the party president. Two things crossed my mind. First of all, I thought, you know what? I do have the luxury now of working in the back rooms to help him win power in the next provincial election. The other thing was that I was frankly appalled at where Mike Harris was taking Ontario. His policies on education and health care and infrastructure. Uh, Ontario was going in a direction that I didn't like. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm not willing to do something about that and help out, then I better stop criticizing. So I decided to become the party president so I had a legitimate platform from which to criticize. You guys win the 2003 election. Yeah. He does become premier. He makes you his finance minister. And the first thing you do 
well, maybe not the first thing you do, but certainly the first thing anybody remembers that you did, was to go back on the one promise that he made during that election campaign, which was, I'm not going to cut your taxes, but I'm not going to raise them either. And in your first budget, you did, in a major way, to pay for what you said were needed investments in health care. Yeah. How could you do that? <laughs> <laughs> how dare you do that? Not how dare yeah. you, but given that that was the one promise everybody remembered, I'm trying to imagine the conversation where you go to him and say, you know what? I need to raise taxes. I well, need to make a liar out of you. Uh, as you, uh, uh, you know, uh, as we went in uh, to uh, our first term as government, uh, the first thing we found out, although we had had hints about it, was that the province's financial situation was much worse than the Tories had led on in their final budget. Uh, so uh, that famous report by a previous Auditor General that the real deficit in Ontario was $5.3 billion. Uh, and that began a conversation uh, we began a public consultation in the fall economic, station, fall economic statement, but it began a conversation between the Premier and I about what our options were. They were really quite simple. Either we are not going to keep our promises uh, when it came to improvements in health care and education uh, and starting to rebuild infrastructure. We could go down that, break all of those promises, or we could break the one very high profile promise uh, with Dalton McGuinty saying during that election, I'm not going to lower your taxes, but I'm not going to raise them either. And uh, uh, ultimately, we had to come to a decision. Which promises were we going to break? And uh, by the time we got to actually crafting the budget, uh, my sympathies were to raise taxes, uh, to uh, bring in the revenue that we needed to uh, start to improve health care and education primarily. How much of a revolt on the backbenches in the caucus did you have to put down when you mentioned that to them? Well, uh, you know, part of my job as finance minister uh, within the cabinet and the caucus was to bring people along. Uh, so I had a lot of conversations with uh, caucus members, both one-on-one -on -one and in groups, uh, you know, and putting the same alternative to them. Break the promises on health care and education or break our promises on raising taxes. And by the time we got to budget day, virtually all of the caucus was, at least on the surface on site, they went back to their writings and got beat up. But the person who got beat up most was not me as finance minister, but the premier, uh, Dalton McGuinty, because it was, it was such a high profile commitment. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say in the book, uh, even when he made that promise during the campaign, uh, my recommendation was don't do it leave us some flexibility. We might have to raise taxes. Uh, but, you know, the wisdom of the campaign team was make that promise uh, and then we had to, uh, uh, and, and it stayed with us for a long time. Mm -hmm. We got through it. We were called fibrils. We were called liars. Uh, you know, in, uh, in my own case, I would go to communities and complete strangers would come up to me and say things like, I'm tired of the lies. <laughs> and I'd say, thank you very much, sir. Have a good day. And you got reelected anyway. And we got reelected, yeah, yeah. I do want to ask you about how you start the book, which is the worst day of your life in politics. You've just finished a meeting with two representatives from CAMH talking about how you're going to improve mental health services. They're lobbying you for more money. When a Globe and Mail reporter comes up to you and says, what? Uh, I'm not going to quote exactly, but uh, something like, Mr. Serbara, do you have any comment on the fact that at this very moment, uh, the RCMP are executing a search warrant uh, at the Sorbara Group looking for information relating to your time as a board member of Royal Group Technologies. My answer was, I have no idea about it, doesn't have anything to do with me. Uh, I haven't been on the board of Royal Group Technologies for uh, virtually two years, so it can't possibly involve me. But the RCMP was casting a wide net looking into this company, and you got caught in that net. I sure did, yeah. And you resigned. Yeah, yeah. How did that resignation come about? Well, you know, you mentioned that the day started with this delightful meeting with Paul Beeston and Paul Garfunkel. And those who read the book will know that perhaps there are too many baseball analogies, but I love the game, and I had this great admiration for Beeston. Uh, we chatted and kidded one another about baseball, so it started off as a great day. By mid-afternoon, I had found out that 
the RCMP were investigating me for a possible conflict of interest during my time as a board member uh, with Royal Group Technologies, and I had been on that board from, uh, I think, 1996 to uh, uh, 2003. I left when I became finance minister. Uh, and it was really quite simple, Steve. The fact is that a cloud was hanging over the province's finance minister. A cloud was hanging over me. Other politicians have chosen to fight through those clouds rather than resign. But in my case, I felt like uh, the good of the many is more important than the good of the one. Uh, I could not allow the distraction of this investigation uh, to take away from the work that the government was doing. And I thought it appropriate to step down. I thought that night that it was all over. Your that whole was career. The, my, that would be the end of my political career. Uh, I thought about other politicians who were under investigation and how they were never able to return. I thought about the fact that sometimes these investigations can go on interminably uh, and that, you know, we might come to the next election. I'm still under investigation. I can't even be a candidate. It was a really hard day. How long did the investigation go on for? It went on for, well, the investigation of Royal went on for quite some time. I mean, the investigation of yeah. me went on for uh, uh, a couple of more months, uh, but I had very good legal counsel who looked at the facts. We finally found out that the allegation was had to do with a small warehouse that the Sorbara Group had sold to Royal Group Technologies. Uh, and my lawyers were able to convince a judge in uh, the Ontario courts that uh, it was inappropriate for my name to be in that search warrant. And the, the cloud finally passed just before uh, Victoria Day, uh, about six months later in early 2006. Judge throws the case out, I think, yeah. before you even had to bring a defense forward, wasn't yeah, there was, it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he just said, uh, uh, there's no basis for this. So you uh, call the was, Premier and tell him. I do. And what does he say <laughs> to you? Uh, I'll never forget the conversation. Because it was the Thursday before Victoria Day weekend. Uh, so everyone's planning to have a wonderful holiday. Uh, Dalton called me and said, I want you to come down this evening uh, and get sworn back in as finance minister. My response was... Dalton, we're on the eve of the Victoria Day weekend. If I do that, there are perhaps three dozen bureaucrats in the Ministry of Finance who will have to completely abandon their holiday plans for the weekend and stick around the office on the seventh floor of the Frost Building and bring me back up to speed in briefings and here's what's going on and prepare me to get back into the fray. So I said, why don't we leave it till Tuesday after the holiday? <laughs> and that's what you did. <laughs> we did. But uh, Dalton said, uh, now I'm going to quote my premier, so forgive me for this. He said, Jesus Christ, you are the guy who is always pushing me uh, to get things done quickly. This is the first time I've ever heard you say, let's just take a little pause. But we did, and it all worked out well. And the swearing in was on Tuesday, and uh, I was back in office. I mentioned earlier you won that 2007 re-election bid. You promised your wife if you won, you'd quit cabinet. You'd stay as an MPP, but you'd quit being finance minister, even though yeah. you loved the job. Yeah, that's right. How unhappy were you at having to make that commitment to her? Well, uh, it was difficult. But, you know, when I originally made the commitment, it seemed like a long way off. And... Let's be truthful. I thought maybe I would be able to once again weasel my way out of it. Uh, you know, I was a politician. <laughs> uh, and like most politicians, we have a craving to be in the spotlight. Let's be very frank about that. Uh, and uh, so the election is over. Uh, the Premier is about to start bringing together the folks that will... Uh, be chosen, will help to choose the next cabinet. We had new members, we had members that retired. Uh, and uh, those meetings were going to go through a weekend, two weeks after the election. It was a very painful night. Uh, I just, I thought, you know what? On the one hand, I'm in a job that I love. And on the other hand, I've made this commitment to a woman who 
is responsible in many respects for the vitality that is inside this flesh. And the and, mother of your six children. And the mother of my six children and a growing number of grandkids. I woke up Thursday morning on that weekend and thought, I know what I have to do. So I picked up the phone and called my chief of staff and said, I need to talk to the premier and I got to let you know that I'm not coming back as finance minister. So I, uh, later in the day, I called Dalton. Now, remember that this throws his plans into complete disarray mm. because he's working on the assumption that I'm coming back. Uh, and if I'm not, someone new has to come into finance and the person that was going to be in that, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. It's the domino effect. So did he try and get you to stay? He said, uh, what about just six more months? And I said, it's not going to happen. He said, what about if I talk to Kate? Your wife. My wife. Uh, and I said, that's not going to happen either. We have, uh, uh, we've come to a decision on this. I said, I'm going to stay as an MPP and I'll stay on with my duties within the party. But uh, uh, one term in finance is what I committed to and uh, that's what uh, the government mm -hmm and uh, the province is going to be left with. So when your party and government brought in the harmonized sales tax, harmonizing the federal GST yeah. with the old retail sales tax provincially, you didn't know about it. It was somebody else who brought it in. That's right. Dwight yeah. Duncan brought it in. And you tell us in the book you thought about resigning because you thought it was such a bad idea. Uh, I, How come? Uh, it was, uh, uh, that, that was one of the low points. It was so tough. First of all, I didn't know. Um, people say, oh, well, you're the former finance minister. They must have consulted you. You have to realize that certainly on taxation matters, the requirement for cabinet secrecy is very, very firm and severe. My sense was that the government in that budget, 2009, was going to present a white paper on, you know, what the ramifications of harmonization would be. And lo and behold, couple of days before the budget and then confirmed in the budget, uh, Dwight Duncan said, we are going to move to fully harmonize Ontario's retail taxes with the GST. And uh, I just thought, well, let me put it in context. The one important job that I have is chair the campaign. My mission is to get the government reelected in 2011. Uh, and uh, I just thought, there's no way that that can happen now. No government in Canada has ever been re-elected, including Brian Mulroney's government, after introducing a GST or an HST. The public reacts very negatively. I think you were a little stronger in the book about it. I think you said something like, why don't I get a gun and go onto the front steps of the legislature and blow my brains out? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, that would be, it would be uh, a quicker and perhaps less painful end. So, uh, I, uh, uh, I thought about uh, simply resigning. Why didn't you? Because I realized that my mission was not to uh, get up on some podium and say, this is awful politically, uh, we're going to get our asses kicked. Uh, my mission was to deal with a, a very tough issue of public policy and be able to bring the party back into a situation where we could actually win the election. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I started to read commentary by a lot of very intelligent economists who made the argument this, that this was probably the most important and essential element to help get Ontario out of the throes of the Great Recession. It was good public policy. Now, as finance minister, I knew that there were very strong elements in this, but as a politician, I thought, you know what? Yeah, you can't survive this. And for me, political survival was very important. Your relationship with the Premier. Yeah. Would you say you guys were buddies? We worked really closely together. But uh, were you buddies? But we were not buddies. Uh, and uh, that is to say, we didn't double date. We didn't go out for a beer after work. Uh, he plays golf, I play tennis. But there was a closeness there that I, uh, frankly, Steve, I've never felt with any other human being because we worked so closely together. Uh, nothing would come before cabinet uh, that I didn't feel comfortable with. And even after I left finance, uh, we had this 
mechanism for consulting one another on virtually all of the important issues. There's a chapter of your book called The Truth About Gas Plants. For sure, yeah, yeah. What's the truth that you think we don't know? Because certainly the narrative that we do know is that your party cravenly canceled some gas plants in order to win some seats yeah, in the last yeah, election. Uh, Two elections ago now. One of the uh, strangest mythologies that has ever emerged around the politics of Queen's Park. And uh, uh, I must say, as a mythology, it was brilliantly played by the opposition parties. Uh, they were able to use the mythology to crucify the premier and, frankly, drive him out of office a year before he was planning on leaving. And I thought, you know, I'm writing a book. Uh, uh, I should probably put the facts on the table because... Uh, Although most people will continue to believe the mythology, uh, I quote George Will, who you know is a great baseball writer, who said, most mythologies are impervious to the evidence. So what's the evidence? Well, the evidence is, first of all, the Oakville gas plant. Everyone thinks, oh, we, we, we canceled the Oakville gas plant to save the Oakville seat. The facts are that the Oakville gas plant was canceled more than a year before the election uh, in uh, 2000 and, uh, uh, Nine. 2000, sorry, no, sorry, 2011. In 2011, yeah. yeah. So, okay, but the Mississauga gas plant was canceled well, just, right in the uh, middle of the campaign. Let's, uh, let's put it in context. Okay. It was a full year. Uh, mm -hmm. Each of the parties uh, supported that move. There was no talk about it. Now, years later, the Auditor General does a report on the potential costs for the cancellation of Oakville. Uh, and the estimate is $650 million. But you gotta read the report. Uh, the report uh, is really takes every possible negative assumption and says if all of these apply, then over the course of 20 years, the cancellation of Oakville will cost potentially $650 million. The truth is, we won't know the costs of Oakville until the plant is finished in Napanee, a willing host. And my suspicion is that uh, the actual costs will be dramatically lower. The other truth is that it was canceled in Oakville because it was poorly situated. And the council in the town of Oakville and the residents said, we will take you all the way to the Supreme Court. That plant will not be built. Okay, that's Oakville. That's Oakville. Mississauga. Fast forward to Canceled Mississauga. in the dying days of the 2011 election campaign. In the last campaign. days of the election, that's right. Uh, was it to save uh, Mississauga seats? Well, the fact is that in Mississauga's case, when the plant was first commissioned, Hazel McCallion and her council were fully in support of it. Everyone agreed that it was to be built. Then the residents, again, the wisdom of the residents, uh, made the case that this was a very bad location. In the election, uh, Tim Hudak went to the site and said, if we're elected, that plant is gone, gone, gone. Now, Tim Hudak didn't do as an assessment of what that would cost. He just made the commitment. Andrea Horvath, the same thing. And the wisdom of those uh, involved in the campaign, and I wasn't involved in that decision, was, well, you know what? Maybe the residents are right. Let's all three parties get on side. If we're reelected, uh, say the Liberals, we will cancel the plant as well. Uh, and, but the issue was, oh, you, know, you did that to save the Mississauga seats. Now, that's just simply not true. I'm the chair of the campaign. Every politician who is in deep trouble in his writing on one issue or another, calls me. Sir Barra, I'm in trouble out here. The party's screwing up. Help me. I didn't get a call from Charles Sousa. I didn't get a call from Laurel Broughton. I didn't get a call from Bob Delaney throughout the whole campaign saying, you better do something about the gas plants or else we'll lo uh, lose these seats. The problem in the aftermath of the decision was that people started apologizing, even the new premier, Kathleen Wynne, started apologizing for what happened. My argument is both of those decisions were fully justifiable, not 
on political terms because the residents of Oakville and the residents of Mississauga were right about the unsuitability of the location of those gas plants. So the Premier was wrong to apologize? The new Premier? I've, I, I, I've, I thought she was wrong. Uh, you know, I mean, politically, maybe it was the most appropriate, the most, the easiest thing to do. But the fact is that the decisions were made based on new and higher standards for where you put gas plants. I mean, you don't want a gas plant uh, a block and a half away from your house. The citizens of Oakville and the citizens of Mississauga were making the same case. The mischief ultimately was in citing those plants in those locations in the first place. Now, every government that I know cancels contracts. Mike Harris canceled the contract to build uh, a subway under Eglinton Avenue. It cost $200 million to fill the tunnel, and now we're digging it out again. William Grenville Davis uh, canceled uh, an expressway which was supposed to go in the heart of the city, and the congestion in that area of the city of Toronto ha has been terrible ever since. Jean Chrétien, Jean Chrétien canceled contracts for helicopters. So, again, I congratulate the opposition parties because they made such a strong partisan case. But the truth is that the decision to cancel those plants were justifiable and the exaggerated costs of those cancellation will never actually come into being. True or false? Uh, 2013 election, can no, sorry, when was the election? 2014. 2000, June, <laughs> June 12, 2014. Just the other day. Yeah. You're watching the leaders debate a week and a half before election day. Kathleen Wynne, First question is about gas plants. She continues to apologize. You're so upset you turn it off. Yeah, I really did. True. Uh, yeah, absolutely true. Uh, you know, there's the old adage uh, in politics, never apologize, never explain. But uh, I think uh, she just went overboard. She was just overcome with the barrage. I mean, I understood why she was doing it. I think probably the pollsters had advised her that the best way to get beyond the issue uh, was to simply apologize and say it will never happen under my administration and that administration is no longer in power. Well, turned out to be right. Absolutely. She won. Yeah, but I don't think she won because of those apologies. I think she won for a lot of different reasons. Uh, has she read the book, do you know? I think she has, yeah. Uh -huh. And have you heard from her? Uh, yes. Uh, there were parts in it uh, where she said... Uh, you were a little bit too hard on me. And, uh, you know, my answer was, you know, I, I did write the book just to say wonderful things about uh, all the wonderful people that I worked with. Uh, I was hard on David Peterson. I was hard on Dalton in places. You don't write a book just to say, oh, weren't we all wonderful? But, uh, you know, the fact is that I think she's doing a fabulous job. I think she is going to be one of the truly great premiers of the province. And, uh, I think I had just a little bit to do with the fact that she ultimately won the job and became premier. You interceded I did. in the leadership campaign at yeah. a moment, actually, when you said you wouldn't, yeah. you said you were going to be neutral. And after yeah. the first ballot results came out, you went onto the floor and you advised Eric, Eric Hoskins, who was dropping off, yeah. that yeah. he had to go to her. Yeah. Why'd you do that? And more importantly, why'd you lie to me about doing it? <laughs> Which is also uh, in the book. I, no, I just used you. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the book. Well, people see you that. know, I, uh, I am on my way out of politics. And uh, if the truth be told, uh, I was sitting on the convention floor with my wife and my assistant of many, many years. And they both just uh, hit me hard in the ribs and said, Get off your high horse. You have to do something here. You know that Kathleen is the best person to lead this party. And I realized, you know what? Uh, I don't know if I can change what's going to happen, but their advice at that point was, I think, sound advice. And Sandra Pupatello hasn't spoken to you since. She has, but not with kind words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's finish on this. A lot of people watching this right now think that what you did for 25 years was a giant waste of time, yeah. right? They hate politics so much, they're extremely cynical about why folks like you are in it. And I wonder if you could just briefly tell us why you think it was worth it. Why is Ontario better because Greg Cerbera was in public life? 
Well, first of all, uh, I just think that politics is important and how we govern ourselves is important. And our political systems need to continually be refined and made better. Uh, look, when you put your name on a ballot, you accept that people will say awful things about you, will accuse you of things, but that's just part of the system. We have a very healthy democracy, and thank God we do. Our healthy democracy is one of the reasons why uh, we are one of the most prized jurisdictions in this tiny planet, and within Canada, one of the most prized jurisdictions. And everyone that gets elected and uh, actually can play a role is called upon to make the place a little bit better. So from 85 to 90, I think we did a really good job. That Peterson government was mostly about improving the rights of citizens, things like pay equity, uh, the Human Rights Code as an example. The McGuinty government was all about improving public services, and I think we did a really good job. Uh, remember what people were saying about our health care system and our education system in 2003. They were saying they're dysfunctional. Now our health care system is strong, is vital, is, is responsive. Our education system is alive and well again. We have set the highest environmental standards uh, from across the country. We have a green belt north of Toronto that is a green lung forever. Uh, we have huge investments in infrastructure, not enough yet. Is it perfect here on earth in Ontario? No, but politicians that want to make things perfect ought to find a different career. Your job there is to do the best analysis you can of how things are and find solutions that are doable. Uh, not to create the best possible solution, but the best solution possible. And I think we had a pretty good run at it. It's all in the battlefield of Ontario politics. That's Greg Cerbera's autobiography, and we thank you for coming into TVO tonight and telling us all about it. Great to be here. Thanks, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.